Gracias. Hello to uh, everybody and thanks for coming along. Um, just like to uh, uh, put out a special welcome to our French visitors, um, Johan and uh, Francois, uh, who have our, our recent arrivals back from the south on uh, Last for Love. So, uh, welcome. Bonjour. <laughs> no, bonsoir. Um, so, um, our talk tonight uh, is from Dale Hughes, VK1DSH. Um, and I'm sure Dale will go through his various various roles in the uh, the ITU. Um, Dale's actually where um, I took the opportunity because Dale was actually down here uh, for work uh, at a conference um, that he's actually presenting and attending, uh, which sounds sounds like a very interesting conference uh, on modelling and simulation. Um, so uh, I grabbed Dale <laughs> and asked him to uh, give us a talk. Um, on the very important work that ha he undertakes in the ITU and the IARU. So, uh, no further ado, I'll hand over to Dale. Thank you. Thank you, Justin. Thanks, Justin. Good evening, everyone. Nice to be here. Thanks for coming along. So, this talk was originally, as the screen says, was by Peter Young, uh, the K3MB. He gave the, the, the original version of this at Pitch Tech earlier this year. Uh, I was asked in the Canberra Radio Club, which I'm a member of, to also talk about it. So I thought, well, I'll grab Peter's talk. He kindly gave me the slides, and I modified it a bit to, to reflect my view of things. But primarily it's his talk with, with some changes for, of my own. So it's talking about the international governance of amateur radio and the role of the IARU in, in particular, because Peter Young is an IARU Region 3 director and he, he thought it would be good to uh, enhance the, the knowledge or broaden the knowledge of what the IARU does and the ITU does in terms of the management, well, not the management, but the, the governance of amateur radio, so the rules and regulations under which we operate and exist. So that's what the talk's about. This is. So I just said all of that. There we go. So that's what I just said. I've changed some slides to reflect that I'm not a director, I've added some slides, particularly about 5 megahertz. So you might ask, who regulates amateur radio? Most people would say the ACMA, that's, that's broadly true, in Australia at least. Our regulator, our administrator is the Australian Communications and Media Authority. They largely deal with all of the issues related to the radio frequency spectrum. There is also the international uh, international regulator that determines the spectrum of rules for all radio communication services, and that's the ITU. So the function of the ITU is to establish the, what's they they manage, if you like, the, the radio regulations, which is an international treaty. And we'll cover more of that in a while, but we'll just talk briefly about the International Telecommunications Union. So they're a specialist agency of the United Nations that deals exclusively with telecommunications, both radio and uh, non-radio. They have their headquarters in Geneva. They have, probably in the UN sphere, they're a bit unusual in that they have membership from governments, so sovereign states and private sector organisations, such as International Amateur Radio Union, for instance, but also the International Maritime Organisation, ICAO, the many, many uh, telecommunications companies, both manufacturers of equipment and carriers, Telstra for instance, Telstra, for instance is a sector member, as are many of the, the bigger worldwide carriers. They're all sector members of the ITU. As far as status goes, all meetings up to the point of the, the treaty negotiations, all the members, both the sovereign states and the, the sector members, are more or less equal. When it comes to the main treaties, treaty negotiations, all the sector members are observers. They don't have a right to vote. They do have a right to participate. So. That only matters really at the main treaty negotiations, which happen every few years. So why is it important? 
So the International Radio Regulations, which is a volume of three books, which you can buy from the IT for about $400, or you can download the electronic version for free. It's relatively boring re reading, but there are all of the frequency allocation tables worldwide, of which the which lists all of the different radio services, their, the frequencies that are allowed to use, and things like footnotes, which we'll talk about later. The radio regulations are international treaty. Australia uh, what's the word? signs on to, there's a particular word, ratifies the treaty. The Australian Parliament ratifies the treaty <coughs> whenever it's changed. So that happens every three to four years. And you can go onto a website, a parliamentary website, which is the Joint Standing Committee on Treaties, and they will list all of the international treaties that Australia is a signatory to, and the radio re the IT radio regulations are there. But the World Radio Conferences, called WRCs, well, between about every three and five years, it changes. In recent years, it's been three to four years, but it does change over time. And as Peter notes here, the radio regulations are critical to the amateur service. They're also critical, critical to every radio service because they dictate exactly how the spectrum should be used. As I say should be used, not how it may be used. So the IARU is a sector member of the ITU. And in fact, the IARU structurally and operationally is, function, is structured somewhat similar to the ITU. It has uh, a, a board. The way it does its documentation and meetings is very similar to what the ITU does. So the ITU was founded in Paris in 1925. The Wireless Institute of Australia was a founding member of the IARU at that time. What does the IARU do? Well, it represents the member, the interest of all the member societies at the ITU and the RTO and the regional telecommunication organisations, which I'll talk about soon. So individual members can't be a member of the individual, uh, individual members cannot be a member of the International Amateur Radio Union. The membership of the IARU are the national societies. And in general, only one national society per country can be a member of the IARU. And that has caused some difficulties in the past and continues to cause difficulties in places like Ukraine. Uh, and in parts of the former Yugoslav Republic, there's difficulties there as well. Political problems cause endless difficulties. <laughs> the IARU is a non-governmental organisation that is recognised by the UN in various ways. Currently there are 167 member societies and in Region 3, so in ITU Region 3 where we live, there are 30 member societies including the Wireless Institute of Australia, JARL, NZERT, etc. So that's a bit about the IARU. There's quite a, a, a fairly simple structure. We have President Tim Allen who's a Canadian Queen's Council, he's a, he's a lawyer, specialises in basically IP issues. President, Vice President Oli Garpstead is a Norwegian, he is a retired engineer, he worked for Talis for many years and he's very technically competent and he knows the bureaucracy very well and he has a lot of friends, so he's useful. Dave Sumner is the secretary. Dave Sumner was formerly the CEO of the AWRL, and he is now the secretary of the IARU. The AWRL acts as international secretariat, so they handle the money side and the organisational side, drafting of documents, all of that sort of stuff that is important for the operation of the IARU. The AWRL puts in a substantial amount of money as well. So the IARU is governed by an administrative council which is made up of, of those, those three people plus a number of other people. They basically all representatives from the member societies get together and they uh, set the policies and goals of the IARU and they do that fairly regularly. And then there's the regional parts of the IARU, so regions one, two and three, to reflect the fact that the ITU regions have different allocations in the, the radio regulation, so the file, the, the file allocation table is divided into three parts and region one and region two and region three 
don't all have the same usage of the radio frequency spectrum, so there are some differences. And there's, of course, cultural and political differences as well, so it gets quite complicated. And there's the ITU region, and we know that we live in Region 3. Um, region 1 is Europe and Africa, and Region 2 are the Americas. So that's, that's divided up for administrative convenience, but also reflects that the, the spectrum is used somewhat differently in different parts of the world. And you'll note that uh, we get some interesting issues with little places in here where we've got places like Iran which are bordered by Region 1 but are part of Region 3. So there's some interesting inter-regional sharing issues there which is, it causes some difficulties at time and similarly with parts of Russia too because they border Region 2 and Region 3 so there's occasionally some issues that will arise because of those, those border regions. It's perhaps not so much a problem between Russia and America because hardly anyone lives up in that top end, but it's certainly much more of an issue here where it's relatively highly populated. But what's the, re the, the line between Region 3 and the northern part of Region? Is that, oh, that's Region 1 with a split in it, isn't it? Or? Which line? So no, is Africa one part one. of Region 1? Or yeah, is Africa's part of Region 1, so this yeah. is all yeah. Region 1. What's Russia part of Russia part of it? Uh, well, it's actually part of Region 1 as well. Okay. So why yeah. that region, why that line's there, I don't know. Um, it's a question, I haven't noticed that, but yes, it's part of Region 1. Fold here. <laughs> so, IARU Region 3 covers the Asia Pacific region, and it has a structure very similar to the overall IARU. The chairman is um, Gogol. Madavan and Ken Yamamoto. I know Ken quite well because I see him regularly in Geneva. He is funded by the JAR, JARL to attend the Working Party Five meetings and some of the regional meetings which I also attend. So the directors meet in person once a year. It's usually part of uh, some ham fest. The last one I think was in Tokyo. They have been here. The directors have met in Australia uh, several times. So they do need to meet regularly, although they have regular teleconferences as well. There's a, a large regional conference which is held every three years where all of the regional members get together to, to talk about policy and, and procedures and, and goals and targets. The last one of those was in Bali in October 2015. The next one will be in Korea in 2018, if Korea still exists. Anyway, uh, it's important that that face-to-face -face meeting occurs because, in my experience at least, it's the best way to make progress in resolving differences. And there are differences within the regions, nothing fatal, but there are, of course, cultural and operational differences which reflect the fact that there are different amateur populations and, and ways of doing things in different countries. So what does the IARU do? Well, the first one is probably where I'm most familiar with. It, the IARU is a sector member of the ITU and attends meetings at the ITU to talk about specific items of interest to the amateur service. And so of course, each time there is a World Radio Communications Conference, there's a number of agenda items. So in the last cycle, we had an agenda item for the amateur service for a new allocation around 5 megahertz. One before that was for new allocation <coughs> band at around 500 kilohertz. Going forward, there's an allocation for a 6 meter allocation in Europe, or in, in Region 1 at least, for the amateur service. They're all for new amateur allocations, but an awful lot of effort, and probably much more effort, is going to you know, is being put into protecting the existing al amateur allocations in all parts of the band. So in the microwave band, there's not, not so much pressure on the HF band, but certainly in the microwave bands, um, 1,000 megahertz and up, or even as, even as low as, as um, 400 megahertz, there's a lot of pressure on those bands for applications such as mobile broadband, 
wireless access, um, mobile phones, new RLAN frequencies, new navigation systems. So all of these will, will may impact in some way the amateur service. So the IOU there is to present the amateur, a unified amateur view on these issues and to try and mitigate any interference issues <laughs> or put forward studies showing why we need more spectrum. Similarly, for the regional telecommunications organisations, um, the ITU, the IAU has a presence of those doing much the same sort of thing. It also coordinates the work of member societies, particularly in areas like interference, um, measurement of the interference of the intruder, um, the intruders into the radio band, as well as other things like proposing ethics and operating procedures, contests. Importantly too, they train this last item here, the IAOU overall is embarking on a program that's been quite successful in providing training to the regulators in developing countries about what amateur radio can do in those countries. And so in, in recent years we've had contact with uh, Bhutan, recent contact with Nigeria, some other, some other states in Western Africa have been very interested in, in building up their amateur service and getting more members because they see it as important for emergency communications, uh, but also technical training of, of the younger people. So that's a very important part of the, the work that the IARU does. What they have been doing is bringing some of those administrators to, say, the US and giving them a week's training all of what amateur radio does, they, they learn the technicalities of amateur radio, the administrative side, and that they then take that knowledge back to their countries. And so that that program is, is quite successful and has certainly helped raise the profile of amateur radio in parts of Africa. How is the IRU funded? Well, all members societies pay their fees to as we pay our fees to the WIA. The WIA pays fees to the regional IA and who pays fees to the, the overarching body. And according to Peter, the WIA pays about what one dollar per member per year for those um, services. And all of the work that the IAU does can be quite expensive. And so volunteers like myself and some of the other uh, people. Uh, have our expenses covered. We don't make any money, but things like living expenses and travel expenses get refunded. Otherwise, it would be very expensive. Any questions so far? All right. So we talked about World Radio Conferences. So we've had quite a lot of success in recent years, in recent conferences. So in, in WAC 79, it was called the World Administrative Radio Conference then. It was the new uh, WAC bands and, and Michael Owen, our former, one of our former WA presidents, was instrumental in establishing those bands. Michael also did, in that year, uh, the, the Article 25 of the radio regulations which describes the amateur service was revised extensively, and Michael being a lawyer had a lot to do with that, and that was an important step forward. Uh, later on in, in uh, WRC 03, uh, 03, so 2003, the requirement for Morse code was eliminated from the radio, radio rigs. There was a new, new recommendation, ITUR M 1544, which is, describes the minimum qualifications for radio amateurs. So that lists the basic technical requirements, the basic, basic um, knowledge of regulations, EMC, that sort of stuff. And importantly, Morse code is not a requirement. And that regulation was revised, we revised that in uh, 2000, we finished revising it in late 2014, just to update it to reflect some of the recent developments in, in amateur radio. 
There's also harmonization of 40 meter band. So harmonization means having the same band across regions. So it's desirable to have the same band for, the, for any particular service the same across regions if you can do it. WRCO7, there was the new allocation, all 2.1 kilohertz of it at 137 kilohertz. However, that was hard, that was not that I was there, but it was uh, it was very fiercely fought, I believe. And so that's our lowest amateur band, and it gets a bit of use. I'd encourage any of you who are interested in uh, some serious RF engineering to get to have a play there. Uh, I can tell you some great stories. <laughs> that my only experience is on, on 137 kilohertz. Uh, WRC 12, I'm very familiar with. That's where we got our 630 meter allocation, so 475 kilohertz. Uh, 9 kilohertz, again, that was very heavily defended by uh, a number of countries, but we did succeed in getting 15, sorry, 9 kilohertz with a 5 watt ERP limit. Fortunately, that might sound, might sound like a low power limit, but it's actually quite hard in practice to, to reach that 5 watt EIRP limit. It's probably Practically impossible in an ordinary suburban environment to, to get to that unless you go to an awful lot of trouble. Uh, WRC 15, our most recent one, again that was that was particularly interesting. So you would be aware that we've got a new secondary allocation. We don't have that yet in Australia, and I'll talk about that in a while. That was fiercely fought. That was even worse than mm -hmm. the previous. Years, Russia and France were very strongly against it, as were a number of other countries. And we coined the phrase, it's commonly heard around the ITU, everyone is equally unhappy. Uh, so the, the opponents were unhappy that we had got it, and we're unhappy that we, we were stuck with what we've got. But we got it, and it's probably better than no band, or it is better than no band. And what is unique about it? There are no footnotes excluding any country in the world. So okay. that is the first unencumbered HF allocation to the amateur service. It falls into that category for a very long time. So the limitations are technical limitations. And I don't think they will affect the utility of the band. The other issue at WRC 15, which was important, was we have a, an amateur allocation well, it says 77.5 to 78 gigahertz. That's our primary allocation. We actually have about six gigahertz up there, certainly four gigahertz, uh, most of which is secondary. And vehicle radar systems, so collision avoidance radar systems, operate in that band. And for their maximum resolution and sensitivity, they need to have a contiguous band which they can operate at four to five gigahertz. So. The sharing studies indicated that the vehicle radar systems and amateurs could share. The only time I would imagine that you couldn't share is if you're standing on a highway trying to operate, and I can't see that happening. So I think um, I think it's okay. And in fact, it's probably a great source for some pretty fancy hardware when these vehicles start getting wrecked, because the radar systems are very interesting and would make a very nice um, 76 gigahertz transceiver. So keep your eye out for <laughs> the wrecked Mercedes. <laughs> uh, because they're very nice, um, fairly broadband, uh, 76 gigahertz transceiver. Uh, I should say that I I chaired the draft. Well, for going back to this year, so I chaired a drafting group here, which drafted the initial footnotes for that that allocation, and I chaired the, the working group decided on that allocation and that was that was two weeks of pure hell. It was just the, was the most difficult thing I've ever had to do. I tried to, to get a compromise and get a hundred people to compromise on any sort of outcome and it just was impossible. Anyway, we, we got there in the end, but it, <laughs> it was really hard work. So how did we get when you say chair, that's just chaired the amateur hundred amateur group. No, 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 this is everyone. No, this, uh, this is Chairing an ITU working group. Right? Yeah, well, it's, yeah, yeah, so yeah. It's the, but it, it generates that each each um, uh, working group at that level drafts the, the necessary radio regular so tries to get a tries to get some sort of um, consensus and then drafts the radio regulations accordingly. 
and it's really hard work. So first of all, you've got to get agreement. The agreement may be no change to the radio regulation, in which case that's easy. But to get changes to the radio regulation, that's often very difficult. And so it's a, a very convoluted program, a process. But so everyone's in there, and once and then once you get agreement at that level, it has to go to the next level up, and it can all be argued again, and then it goes to the plenary, and someone like who's never been to any of the meetings can object, and so <laughs> got to go back and do it all again, or argue it out in plenary, which you don't really want to do. So it's it's, it's quite a it's quite a process because what you're ending up doing is creating a document for an international treaty, so it has to be done just right, and there's a whole protocol and procedure. Um, it's all very it's annoyingly polite. You just can't go and thump some bloke because he's an idiot. Uh, it's, it has to be done just, just right. Otherwise it can be an international incident. Anyway, so how do we get to a WRC? So IT the radio sector of ITU. So there's the radio sector, there's the telecommunication sector, there's the development sector. And they all have different functions. I mostly focused on ITUR. Most of those meetings are usually, usually in Geneva, although we had one in Bucharest a couple of years back, and the next WRC will be in Egypt, which will be a heap of fun. Uh, so study group five is a hierarchy. Uh, ITUR is divided up into a number of study groups, and study group five covers terrestrial services. Study group four does satellites, mostly. Study Group 6 does broadcasting, Study Group 7 does science services, Study Group 3 does propagation, Study Group 1 does um, spectrum management. I have no idea what spectrum uh, Study Group 2 does. I should look it up. In under Study Group 5, there's working parties 5A and 5B. 5A covers the land, mobile, amateur and notably amateur satellite service. So most of the satellite services belong in Study Group 4, but for whatever reason, the Working Party 5A does satellite services. Under 5A is Working Group 5A1, and it, ha it has the responsibility for all issues related to amateur and amateur satellite services. And that is my group. I've been through that. Excuse me, um, Dale, how big is a working group then? Like the group that you're working with, how many people will be in that? Uh, working group can vary. The last few meetings we've probably got 30 people. So quite a few, actually. Um, between 20 and 30. Depends what issues you're discussing. It's, it depends if we've got some fairly dry issue about you know, coordination of satellite services. You might get half a dozen people. Uh, but for a new agenda item, there'll be a lot more. So Anyway, I've sort of got a bit out of order here. There you go, the study group to developing countries. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes, okay. I oh, know that's an ITU D, oh. so that's the development sector. The reason that's there is because we have the IRU has a representative there, particularly for, as I was saying, developing countries and encouraging the amateur service, but also a strong emphasis on emergency communications. The ITU has lots of meetings. Uh, I, I generally go to the working party meetings and the WRCs, but there's a council meeting, there's a plenary potentiary, and then there's a conference preparatory meeting. Uh, if you're really interested, I can tell you about some of those, but they're all pretty dry. The important thing is the um, working party 5A. Um, I would have structured this talk differently, but anyway. <laughs> But there are, there are more meetings, and I mentioned before RTOs, so regional telecommunications organisations. So the, the various regions have their own mini ITU, I suppose would be the way of, of describing it. In the, in the Asia Pacific region, we have the Asia Pacific Telecommunity, and they they meet every year roughly and duplicate some of the the work that the ITU does, but from a regional perspective. And the, 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 block, the regional blocks now have quite a lot of power in the meetings because you can go into a meeting, if you're, a, if you're representing one of those meetings, you're representing maybe 30 countries, 
And so you've got a lot more um, influence in a meeting rather than a single country. And so that was very useful, WRC 12, because the APT supported the uh, new amateur allocation around 16 metres. And so when the time came, I was able to say, well, the, the APT supports this. And so that's 30 countries supporting that issue, much better than just one. The APT met in Bali in July. Okay. So this is some idea of the, the policy of the process. So out of let's start at the back end. So each WRC, in this case WRC 15, sets the agenda item for agenda items for the next World Radio Communications Conference. So things like you know, a new amateur band wherever, or a new band for our lands. So if, in fact, they set the agenda items for the next WRC, three years or three or four years away, as well as preliminary agenda items for the, the one that's the one after that. So they're looking forward up to eight, you know, six or eight years ahead, which is a bit hard given the rate of change of technology, but that's what happens. Anyway, so we get a new agenda item in Australia. We have the WRC Preparatory Group, which is run under the auspices of the ACMA. That group meets about twice a year. And all of the representatives of various radio services in Australia are a member of that group. So I'm there representing the WIA, there's the broadcasters, the satellite operators, defence. There's uh, 60 or 70 people attend, are members of the pre uh, Preparatory Group. Also in Australia, we have um, a number of study, a radio, Australian radio study group. There's IRSG5, covers the amateur service, in fact it covers all terrestrial services, and it does some work, and it provides input to Working Party 5, uh, Working Party 5 at the ITU, and output from there comes back here, so that's a, a, like a little feedback loop to try and refine basically the technical side of things. So Working Party 5 does some very detailed technical studies, and Australia submits their own studies, and that's a feedback process. And, and I mentioned study group five, the output of uh, Working Party 5 goes to study group five, which approves it, and ultimately those documents, as technical studies, go into each WRC. And here, so the, the output of these two groups are informed by the stakeholders' needs, so the needs of the amateur service or the needs of the, the broadcasters, for instance. But importantly, and more growing in influence is government policy. So the government decides mobile telephones need more frequency. Um, and we can argue we're blue in the face that they don't, but the government says you do. And so this is becoming a, a much bigger influence in the decision making government policy. Regionally, the same sort of thing happens. The output from the WRCP preparatory group goes into the APG meetings, uh, a document known as Australian, Prel Australian Preliminary View for all agenda items is submitted to APG and we, we argue about that for a week, some part of the region, and the output from that comes back to Australia and we modify our view or we uh, strengthen our view and that goes round and round and round. Eventually there's an APT view which goes into WRC as the regional view. And the same thing for CTEL, which is the uh, Americas, there's the Arab Spectrum Management Group, there's the CPT, there's the, um, the RCC, which just covers the Russia reform, and the, um, there's sort of a, a, what's it? Regional, regional cooperation in the field of communications, which is basically Russia, um, Ukraine, all of those former Soviet states have their own sort of uh, regional grouping. And then also there's the Australian view, the finalised Australian view, after all of these feedback loops, just prior to WRC, the, this group meets the final time to finalise Australia's view. That goes to the, the Minister for Communications for approval and also goes to the Department of Foreign Affairs. They approve it, they approve the delegation because going into here, we are members of an Australian delegation and have to be approved by the government as you're rep representing Australia. 
and you have to represent Australia's views. So what can happen is we, we have an, an agenda item and Australia all of a sudden, for whatever reason, doesn't agree with it. If I'm going to take part in the process, I then have to go and oppose it with WRC. Fortunately, that hasn't happened, but it could happen in principle. And so round and round it goes. It just keeps on going. It's, it's a very complicated process, and it's taken me a long time, some years, to figure out how it all works and to be able to work within the system because it's a giant bureaucracy. So any questions on that? It's, it's, it's complicated. Mm. Um, it's how it works. And, and it's probably how it works on other sort of treaty issues too. I can imagine it works with climate change processes, for instance, and you know, the International Whaling Committee. It, it, all of these things which are contentious for all sorts of reasons would have similar processes where you've got to achieve consensus. It's very similar to the entire treaty, all that <laughs> process. Be, yeah, it would be very similar. So who does what? Um, for amateur-specific issues, the IOU develops spectrum requirements. So there's a lot of calculations being done at the moment for the new 6 meter allocation, proposed 6 meter allocation in Region 1. Uh, the IOU participates in the various ITU sharing studies by submitting sharing studies and documents and that's all a process, so all of these documents have to be in a certain format. And they all go into the meetings and the role of the working groups is to try and come up with a consensus result. So member societies participate through domestic pre preparation, so the WIA is part of the, the ACMA preparatory process. And they also provide input to the IAIU. And then the IAIU regions contribute documents as part of the, the regional uh, process. So, as you can see, there's an awful lot of paperwork and an awful lot of meetings to go to. I'm getting back to working group 5A1, so I chair that group. My trips there are funded jointly by the WIA and IAIU. We meet twice a year in Geneva two weeks at a time, usually in May and November. Somebody asked about how many, how many people attend the working group meetings. It varies, but we have a sort of a core of amateurs who attend most meetings. So John Cyberling from ARRL, Hans Blondell Timmerman, IAOU, Ronnie Garpstead, IAOU. Ollie can sometimes be a Norwegian or sometimes IAOU, depending upon whether we meet a Norwegian or an IAOU delegate. Um, Brian Rawlings, he's Canadian. Um, Yin, who's a China, uh, from China. He's only just started coming, and it's good to see the Chinese profile of these meetings increasing. So that they're starting, their amateur societies are starting to play a, a bigger role in their process, in their um, internal, um, the internal workings of, of communications in China, which is very good actually, because that will help us, because often. In the past, China has been strongly opposed to any new amateur delegation uh, any, uh, allocation. So it's, it's, it's very pleasing to see that they're starting to have some influence there in making a much more amateur friendly um, China. Ken Yamamoto, I mentioned before from JARL. Billy Muller, who's from DARC. Uh, Dave Court from the uh, RSGB. Dave is leading the current work on the Gender Island 1.1, which is the new 6 meter allocation. So they're the, the, and myself, they're the amateurs. Occasionally we get other amateurs come, but mostly this is the core of people. And then there might be as many or more non-amateurs who are representing either other IQ sector members or uh, administrations. So you usually always have one or two Russians there. Uh, the French, the um, US, aside from John, often the, the US structure is quite interesting because they have, in effect, two, two bodies which deal with spectrum management. So there's the NTIA, which does all the, the uh, government and defense spectrum planning, and then the FCC, which does all civilian. And they don't always agree with one another, so that makes life a bit interesting. Um, who else do we have? often have um, a number of other European countries who 
uh, it can be amateur friendly or amateur unfriendly depending upon what the agenda item is. We, last meeting we had a lot of Africans there and also some South Americans, which is good. So the meetings can be quite, quite lively and we try, what we have to do is take various input contributions and come up with some sort of consensus text at the end. Do you, do you have translation into different... No, at this level it's all done in English. And what about the plenary? Is that translate? Um, at the WRC, all of the, all, in general, most of the, the discussions there are done in six languages. Yeah. Uh, but at this level, with the working party meetings, it's all in English. Yeah. Sometimes French, but nearly always in English. So what does success at WRC look like? Well, in principle, no reduction of the existing amateur spectrum. So far we've been fortunate, although we might have had to share with other services like vehicle radar. But in general we've done pretty well. We've got some new allocations in recent years, small ones, but we haven't lost any significant uh, chunks of uh, spectrum. So IRU strengths, it's well respected. It's had a very long involvement with the ITU. Lots of ITU delegates are amateurs, even though they may not be necessarily on amateur issues, so a lot of maritime people are amateurs, a lot of aviation people are amateurs, and we know they're there, but they usually can't help you very much. And there's good PR, the IOU makes sure there's always some information on emergency communications, we assist regulators, so that sort of public relations is quite important. How they do it is an amateur station at the ITU in Geneva, 4U1 ITU, and during WRCs, it's, there's a 4U1 WRC, that's quite popular. And that is a focus of amateur activity, and it's a really good place to take non-amateurs up to see how it all works. The IAU provides handouts, delegates, is using the article in the ITU News. There's a small reception for people to come along and meet amateurs. Of course, they lobby people and they participate. So that's how it all works. Just briefly about WRC 19. So the main agenda item is this one here for amateurs. It really has little impact upon us in Region 3. We'll see how it goes. It's a bit early to tell how it will work. The IRU has a wish list of new agenda items they might like to talk about, but it's practically impossible now to get a, a, a new agenda item up, particularly for an amateur service, without very strong support <coughs> and, and that appears to be, we don't, I, I think going forward we're not going to have much support for new bands. I think we have enough and we might want some harmonisation. But we'll see how it goes. Strange things can happen. This is a bit of specifically about what Region 3 directors do. I might just skip over that. IAU monitoring system is important. And Peter Young deals with that in this country. He has some quite sophisticated equipment for monitoring and he's always looking for reports. But you know, the reason for bringing this in is that, for instance, the radio regulation is full of footnotes. There's hundreds of the darn things. And you'll note that these things here are foot we'll called footnotes. And so while the amateur band may be primary in this bit here, and we're allowed secondary status. Well, in, the, in general, the amateur band might be primary in, that's in, that, in the radio regulations, but actually in Australia, we're a secondary service. So which means that what you might think is an intruder is perfectly Legit. legal to be there. And so you have to be careful when you think somebody's intruding in the bands, because they may not be. So it might be permitted to be there under some footnote rights, so we need to be sure about that. So there's some, expect, uh, some specific footnotes um, showing that in Uzbekistan and Kyrgyzstan, uh, the fixed and mobile services operate on a mobile and secondary basis. In Australia, the band 7100, 7200 is also allocated as fixed and mobile service, so you might get some of those users between uh, 7100 and 7200 kilohertz. So you've got to be a bit careful about who you call intruders. Now, 
5 megahertz. So we've got a new 5 megahertz band. We'll be. Here it is. Where is it? Somewhere there. <laughs> Not right at the top. Right the bottom. Mm. Uh, yeah. How this one? It's like one three three B. I know it well. So we have a small allocation, whatever it is, and or a secondary allocation, and it's a global allocation. And in Australia, so this is an extract from the Australian frequency allocation table. So this bit is in the radio regulations. And this bit is in the Australian version of the radio regulations. And we have an Australian footboat, 57. What does that mean? It means this. So footnote OS 57 says, the band may be used by stations of the radio location service for the purposes of defence, etc, etc, etc. So that's the Jindalee over horizon radar system. And if you look... Interestingly, you can actually find quite a lot of details about that system in the register of frequency allocations. Uh, the fact that they use 10 kilowatts and various other things. And therefore, it's an issue of national security. There are also incumbent services such as police, ambulance and aviation. And that will make sharing with amateurs rather interesting. And that is the issue why we haven't been yet, the ACMA hasn't been able to yet resolve this issue as far as Australian access to that band. The WIA is working quite hard with the Defence Department to try and come up with some resolution to OS 57. And it may well have to wait until the RADCOM Act is reviewed, which is starting to happen now, and the radio and the amateur licence conditions are redrafted, which will happen after the RADCOM Act is reviewed. So we will get it eventually. But it may be some time coming. So, can you help? Yes, you can join the National Society if you're not a member. Uh, support the WIA, make a donation, and follow the DX Code of Conduct. So, that was Peter's talk, modified by me. Thanks for listening. Any questions? So, it probably took a bit long. <laughs> so I'm just wondering with the uh, the working group five, which uh, handles the spectrum management for amateur like satellite stuff. So uh, if you wanted to throw up a CubeSat, you'd actually approach what working group five. To no, no, actually, no. It's quite it's quite complicated. It's um, getting pretty cheap now. I thought perhaps the club might want to put one up sometime. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, right. you can go and buy one for 60,000 euros. <laughs> no, so all the satellites are subject to coordination. So coordination yeah. two types. Frequency coordination, so you don't cause interference. Secondly, orbital coordination, so they don't crash into one another. Yeah. Um, sure, you can get a light, you can get a, you can buy a satellite and you can even get it launched if you've got enough money. But in general, um, um, any launch facility won't launch it unless you have the appropriate paperwork. And the ITU is the organisation which does the, uh, in general, the frequency allocation and the orbital allocations. Although, for amateur satellites, they have devolved that responsibility to the IARU, yeah. uh, who has um, Hans Blondell Timmerman, who is on the regular meeting attender. He's the IARU satellite, satellite coordinator, so he spends a lot of time try to coordinate satellite frequencies and all of that sort of stuff. He then issues the appropriate paperwork so that an amateur satellite can be launched. So ordinarily the ITU handles all of commercial satellites or scientific satellites. And that process can take a very long time because it, it, that's all covered in Article 9 of the radio regulations and it's a, I looked at it the other night. It's a massive words. It's quite complicated. Basically because you have to make sure that your satellite doesn't cause interference to terrestrial services or other satellite services. Mm. So that's really complicated. So working party, f working group 5A1 might be asked to comment on some issues related to the regulations and we, we made comment at the last working party meeting about people wanting to make, wanting to make some changes to the 
radio regulations, or not so much the regulations, but the, the procedures to be followed to coordinate satellites. And as far as amateurs are concerned, it's working just fine. I know that doesn't suit some of the other organisations because they want to speed up the process because it could take quite a long time to get through the process. Mm -hmm. In general, it's handled by the, what's called the uh, Radio Bureau at the uh, ITU, so they do most of the coordination for all satellites other than strictly amateur satellites. So Dale, in terms of the time frame, what would it be, months, years? Uh, the minimum time you could do it is reckoned to be about a year for coordination, but it can take, if your paperwork's not in order, or if there's some issues about um, frequency interference or potential interference or orbital problems that it could take a long time, could take years to sort out. And in fact, in Australia's case, there has been, not an amateur satellite, but for some of commercial satellites, it's, you know, it's taken five or six years, uh, and, and even resulted in sort of threats of legal action. But that's not doing that. So it can take a long time. So you, you would get the allocation and know where you're going to go before you think about building a satellite. Ideally, yes. Otherwise, get technology out of date with something yeah. else. Well, that's true. Uh, it's it's really complicated for the geostationary ones. It's bad enough for the, the, the orbited ones, but it's even worse for the geostationary ones because every country is allowed a certain number of orbital slots and that orbit's getting pretty full. Mm -hmm. And so they're bringing the court to what they call the coordination distance down. So currently, previously each satellite sort of was considered to operate in a cube of about 75 kilometres aside, bringing that down to 50 satellites. It's 50 kilometres so they can fit more satellites in. Of course, not every country launches a geostationary satellite and those orbital slots are worth a lot of money, so countries sell those slots to other other users. Um, and it, it can take a long time to get coordination. Are the what, slots based on their land area or their population, or they vary enormously? Uh, I think it's basically just the number of slots. I don't, I don't think it matters. Mm. Uh, I'm not certain about that, but it's my understanding is it's just the number of slots for all 193 member states or whatever it is. I mean, too, like, like Russia, like especially in geostation, and probably want more slots because they've got a huge landmass, but all Pacific nation they sell that doesn't. Slots. <laughs> so they just sell this. Yeah. Well, they, they lease it to somebody else. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Okay. To be honest, I mean, I haven't had a lot of involvement there, mm. uh, but that's an interesting question. I'll, I'll have a look at that. Is there much discussion in these circles about uh, interference from the low power stuff uh, that it comes out of everywhere that invades all our? Yes, there is, and it's becoming much more important. And that's that's. In fact, there was an interesting study in Working Party 5B that the Germans put up because they're very concerned about interference to maritime communications, and they've done some surveys out in the North Sea, which was previously a quiet area, and it's no longer quiet. Mm -hmm. And North Sea has gone up many decibels, and so this is becoming an increasing concern right through the ITU. And it's a particular worry with things like. Um, the push now for wireless power transmission, and so the IOU is very concerned about that, even though it's a relatively low frequency. There are um, some proposals to have wireless power transfer around about 6.5 megahertz, which is allowed under the, because it's an ISM frequency, same as 13.56, uh, which is an ISM frequency. So there's, there's a Increasing concern about the rising noise volume. That's problematic because there's what we can do depends. You know, it's hard to know what uh, where that will lead because a number of countries, notably Japan and Korea, are pushing for it because of their industrial output of these devices. And so it's again it's a very contentious issue. But it's certainly been fought quite hard to try and control these things much more. And I think we will see changes to regulations, but like, the impact of that will be felt over time. So there is no magic sort of pill right now, but it is an issue. And part of the problem is also that the standards for these things aren't all set by the ITU. You've got various other standards bodies who set, you know, there's, there's CISPA and um, IEC and then various other organisations which set um, standards for devices. And they don't always consider radio communications because these things aren't radio communications devices. It just happens that they they're unintentional emitters, and they cause interference. So it's it's, um, it's 
it's a very tricky area, but it's becoming much higher in importance. So you mentioned in the the flow chart of getting <coughs> to a WRC that they um, they set some of the agenda um, for the next one and also potentially for the next one. Yep. Um, given the speed of technological change, how, how, how do they accommodate that sort of stuff? Mostly they try to be what they call technology neutral. Okay. So for instance, there might be a new RLAN allocation, yep. but they don't specify what technology might be used, it's just an allocation. So okay. if the, the IEEE standard, you know, 802 got whatever changes to 805 dot something else, as long as it fits within the band, they don't care. That's it, okay. But it's technology, same as the amateur band, the amateur allocations. We've got X number of kilohertz, of, you know, we've got um, 200 kilohertz at, 40, at, at um, 20 metres. They don't care, the regulations don't care in general whether we use it for CW or JTA or SSB or whatever. It's technology neutral, it okay. sets an allocation. It's not true in every country because the FCC does mandate, in the US for instance, a band plan and you, you're not supposed to operate different modes in different parts of the band. In Australia, we have a band plan, but that's just a general decision by the mm. WIA. As far as the ACMA is concerned, they don't care. Yeah. So okay. they try to be technology neutral and that works to a large extent. So broadcasting has changed from analog to digital. Uh, in general, that doesn't affect the allocation. It affects how the signal is sent, but it doesn't affect the allocation per se. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Any other questions for Dale? I was just going to raise the question of the priorities. Where I, I, I mean, I think it's nice to say our goal is to preserve all the frequency we can, but I personally think that the trade-off for harmonisation is far more important than having a, a great wide band where it's not the same, like I'm well, 10 gigs, I can't work JA and this, because they, their frequency is on a different frequency to the rest of the world. And I would have thought, with the pressure on, and, and most amateur modes don't use a lot of spectrum really, we just want some common spectrum that we can share with yeah. around the world and I, I sort of just question whether we shouldn't change our priorities. Well that I think ultimately will be forced upon us. Yeah. Uh, it's hard to justify for instance 250 megahertz at 47 megahertz. Yeah, <laughs> not many, many people use it. <laughs> no, everyone's working two and a half, two and a half kilohertz side, single sideband, those users are. What we really need, my personal view is, we've got lots of bandwidth where we can use it, we should be using it, and not focusing on the weak signal modes, but developing some fancy new wideband mode to make use of the frequency. That would demonstrate some innovation and justification of the band. I mean, that's just my personal view. And I know it's being on YouTube, but it's my personal view. <laughs> <laughs> that we really do need to, in, in many instances, start thinking about how we can use creatively some of this spectrum that we've got to show that we, we need it. And I know for, for Generator 1.1, the, the possible 6 meter allocation in, in Region 1, they're developing methods, they have a, a system for reduced bandwidth digital TV, so if they can fit a high definition TV signal into 300 kilohertz. And so this, this adds some weight to the fact that we want, the, the amateur should have some, some spectrum there. I mean, they've got spectrum, um, and it's used in many countries in Region 1, but it doesn't actually fit in the frequency allocation table, so it can be taken away at any time. So it operates under what they call a general um, Article 4.4, .4, which basically says countries can do whatever they like, um, as long as they don't cause interference. And so lots of countries in Europe have allowed average to operate in a 6 meter band, but it's not it's not in the frequency allocation table, and so it can be basically taken away at any time. Perhaps the other way of looking at that situation is think of all the things you want to do, work them out so that they can happen, mm. and make your best use of the frequency allocations that are available, and maybe move a band in order to uh, find that uh, greater bandwidth. Yeah. In other words, let, let your mind think the other way around rather than 
I want to do this in that bandwidth, so I want to do this, where can it fit? That's right. And you've got some wonderful microwave bands that we can start really using on this big white signal. There's plenty of space. We'd have to have a different mindset, for sure. Um, as part of these study groups, do, do they do audits of, of the usage of, of the spectrum? Um, well, yes and no. It's, I think people might want to do that, but it's not done mm. for, because all sorts of people are holding on a spectrum that they might have to then give up. Yeah, okay. In fact, it's an argument I've tried to stay away from here. People say, well, such and such a band isn't being used by such and such, we should have it. And my answer to that is, well, yeah, okay, go and listen to the, all these amateur bands. Who are you going to hear there? Mm. Yeah. Uh, Correct. It's so right. it's a double edged sword. You know? Yep. Don't poke the bear. What? Don't poke the bear. Don't poke the bear, exactly. Mm. Okay. Um, we're very fortunate with amateur, ba with amateur bands in general, and we do need to justify their existence. Um, that's why it's important that we come up with creative things like the, the reduced bandwidth digital TV. I think that's a great idea. Yeah. That's happening in Europe. There's Hamnet, which is another, um, another innovation which may come here. So it's like a, an amateur broadband network which is used for all sorts of things in Europe. On, on what frequency? Uh, I think it's used on 3.3 gigs and 5 gigs. Okay. Um, but the proposal is to start using that around 50 megahertz. Okay. Not the same bandwidth, of course, but for people to connect to Hamlet on that frequency. That's so it's justification. So it's a, what, like a mesh network? Yeah. Okay. So there's interesting things happening. And I. I hope we can get a new allocation for Region 1, we'll, we'll see. And how much time do you spend away from home? Uh, every year, well, I go to Geneva twice a year, so that's two weeks, and there's usually an APG meeting, which is usually a week. Um, so that's five weeks, the WRC can be four weeks, plus whatever other meetings. And then there's all of the, the, the local meetings, so there's two or three preparatory group meetings each year, that's a day, that's in Canberra, and then there's ASG 5, maybe four times a year. But I'm also a member of ARSG 1 and ARSG 3, so I only... So yeah, a lot of meetings. <laughs> but when do you get time to mow the lawn? Unfortunately, it doesn't grow much lately. Although after this rain, I will. My wife is very tolerant. <laughs> okay. Well, that's about all for me. Thanks for listening. I hope you found it interesting. Sure, appreciation. <laughs>